Today we continue to talk about God's crazy love. A couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago actually, I spoke about the psalmist who wrote that when I consider your heavens and the works of your fingers and the moons and the stars you set in place, what are we human beings that you care about us at all? That's a paraphrase. That's the miracle of God's crazy love. That as little as we are, God loves us. The universe is enormous. God may be more magnificent than we could ever imagine, and we may be nothing but the, of a grain of sand, and yet God is so great, and God is so powerful, and God is so magnificent that he cares about even little old us. Then two weeks ago, Jeff called us to love and forgive with the compassion of God, even when having a bad hair day. When we want to respond to those who hurt us with anger and with hatred, God calls us to the same kind of crazy love, to forgive and to share that love with others. And then last week, I talked about changing how we pray. Instead of us being God's advisors and giving God a, a list of things that God needs to get done that day, maybe we should start listening more and listening for God's call in our lives. We have two more of these crazy love sermons. Today we're gonna to talk about a running God, and next week we're gonna talk about entertaining angels. But for today, I don't want you to open your Bibles. I want you to listen to the story of the prodigal son as if it's the first time you've ever heard it, okay? By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus. And they were hanging on every word that he said. Now the Pharisees and the other religious leaders and the scholars were not pleased with this at all. They growled and said, he takes on sinners and eats food with them. He treats them like old friends. All of their grumbling is what triggered this story. There was once a man who had two sons. The younger son went to his father and said, Dad, I want what's coming to me and I want it now. So his father divided up the, properly, the property and the money and gave it between the two boys. And it wasn't long before the younger son had all of his stuff and he packed his bags and he left off for a, a distant country. There he squandered it all. He partied a lot, probably went out with women and did things he probably shouldn't have been doing. And he wasted every bit of it. And after he'd gone through all the money, there was a famine and a drought and he began to have to live on the streets and he didn't know what to do so he signed on with a farmer who assigned him to slop his pigs and he was so hungry that he would have eaten corn cobs out of the pig slop except for the pigs wouldn't share. That brought him to his senses and he thought to himself you know, there's a whole bunch of farmhands back at my father's place, and they sit down to three meals a day, and I'm starving to death. I'm going to go back and see Dad. I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against God, and I have sinned against you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. You know, you've got to sound righteous if you're going to do that. <laughs> So he got up and he went, went home to his dad. And when he was a, a long way off, his father saw him. And he went out in the porch and waited for him. When the son got closer, the father smacked him about the head and grabbed his ear and said, Where the devil have you been? The son said, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your servants. And the father said, you're not just a kidding. You aren't worthy of anything. I suppose you think you can waltz back in here without a, so much as a buy your leave and con me with some dramatic speech. Do you think this is Little House on the Prairie? You think I was born yesterday? No, my son, you're going to be cleaning toilets until you earn back every dime that you squandered. And the son said, so does that mean there's no chance of a lot of presents and instant forgiveness and a, a celebratory meal involving the fatted calf or something like that? And the father said, in your dreams, son, in your dreams. And the father took the prodigal by the ear and hauled him off to the farm. And lo, the fatted calf saw what was happening and summing it up properly through a big party. And the fatted calf's family and guests did a lot of disco dancing and rejoicing. And they mooed sarcastically as the sun walked by. And as evening fell, the prodigal's elder brother heard the sounds of his brother cleaning toilets. And he strolled out after supper holding a large glass of brandy and lit an enormous cigar. And he stretched out, picking his teeth, and looked down over the fence and said, Evening, Rambo. I see you've returned. How do you like your choices now? And the prodigal looked up and said, you can put me down and you smug, self-righteous hypocrite. I'll get even one day. And the elder brother departed, feeling pretty satisfied with himself. So the younger brother found his father and said, all these years when I was off in another country, this smug, self-centered, hypocritical brother of mine must have caused you to gnash your teeth every single day. How come he gets all the perks like brandy and cigars and I have to clean toilets? And the father said, your brother's boring, but he does what he's told. Now get back to work, count yourself lucky, I'm not just throwing you back out to the pigs. Is that not the way you remember the story? <laughs> that, that version came from Adrian Plass. Uh, from a sermon for the Angeli uh, Anglican, excuse me, Anglican Evangelical Conference. But it falls into the category of what Jesus' followers would have expected to hear. Scholars have discovered a similar story to the one that Jesus taught, that the Jewish rabbis told for many years before Jesus told it. And in the earlier form, the younger son ran away, spent all his father's money, and when he came crawling home, the father rejected him. So as Jesus was telling this story, the Pharisees were thinking to themselves, I've heard this one before. His audience of Pharisees and religious scholars expected him to say, one day the father saw the son returning and waited with crossed arms. The broken down son begged his father to take him back, but the father looked away from him and said, forget it. You had your chance. You chosen to live like a pig. Now go back to the pigs. You made your bed. Now lie in it. That's the story that they thought they knew. The father in the original story turns the son away and told him he was getting exactly what he deserved. It's the story reflecting the Hebrew scripture idea of legalism. Matter of fact, the Hebrew scriptures prescribed that a father could have a rebellious son stoned to death. But that's not the story Jesus told. The story Jesus told, the boy starts coming back and the father throws his arm around his neck in delight, he welcomes his home, him home with open arms and he throws a party and he kills the fatted calf. The story of the prodigal son is so well known to us that we miss the fact that to Jesus' hearers, it was shocking. It was countercultural. 
almost as much as when I told the story the other way and you all looked at me like, what? Jesus is trying to make us understand what God is like. But the scribes and the Pharisees thought they already knew the answer. So when Jesus starts the story about the two sons, they thought they knew what they were going to hear. Yet Jesus paints the picture of a father waiting desperately for his son to return. Probably for months the father had been standing out there in that porch praying that his son was going to come back. He paints a picture of a father waiting desperately desperately waiting. He's gazing at the horizon every chance he gets to see if his son is there. And when he does see his son, before his eyes know it's him, his heart does. And he does the most undignified thing for a wealthy man in this time. He runs. Now in this culture, you did not run if you had wealth and rank. You just didn't do it. You paid somebody to do it for you. But the father is desperate to see his son, and he runs to him. Alan was a pretty normal boy from a medium-sized medium town, probably about the size of Perry. And he loved his dog. He had been after his parents for a dog since he was five years old, and finally on his ninth birthday, his parents gave him a dog. And so what do you name a dog? You named him Rover, because that's a good name for a dog. And he loved this dog as much as any boy ever loved a dog. Every day when he got home from school, Alan would take Rover over to the yard to play, and the, it's a favorite part of his day. And by the time he was 10, his mother regularly had to shout at him to come in and do his homework, because all he wanted to do was play outside in the yard with the dog. One day, Alan came home from school as usual. He put his books down as usual, and he took Rover out in the yard as usual. And a friend come by and called Alan over. And while they chatted and laughed, Rover chased squirrels, just like he always did. But soon Alan realized he didn't hear Rover barking anymore. And when he turned around, he was gone. I mean, you can imagine what happened next. He ran all over the yard, all over the block, yelling out Rover's name, Here, boy! It must have echoed throughout the town. Once his mother figured out what was wrong, she put Alan in the car and they drove up and down streets, calling looking, hoping, they didn't find him. Alan could hardly eat dinner that night and the next few weeks weren't much better. He missed that dog so much and he never really stopped looking for him. And every weekend his parents would take him down to the pound to see if Rover had been brought in there. And he even started reading the local newspaper. For a 10 year old boy that's something big to read a newspaper. And so he starts reading the newspaper to see if there's any news about the dog. And weeks passed but Alan wouldn't give up hope. And then one day as he was walking home after school kicking rocks and taking his time not really wanting to get home to face his house without a dog. Something at the far end of the street caught his eye. Instinctively, he immediately knew what it was, and he started to run, and his backpack was slowing him down, so he threw it off and left it in the street, and his hat blew off and ended up in somebody's yard, and he ran two and a half blocks at full, spe full speed, and yelling, Rover! But by the time he could get there, all he could get out was Rover. <laughs> and he scooped his dog up in his arms, and he hugged him tight. This dog that was full of mud, half starved, probably full of fleas, but Alan didn't care. Because he'd found his dog. Rover was coming home, and that meant everything to him. And if you ask Alan, later why he ran so far and so hard to get his dog, he probably would have looked at you funny. The answer is obvious. He loved the dog. 
and it didn't matter what he had to do to get him home. God loves us more, much, much, much more than any boy ever loved a dog. Now you might think the father in the parable, why he ran so far and so hard to meet his son, but if you were one of his servants, or one of the fellow villagers who knew him, they would have been thinking to themselves, how can he behave this way? This wealthy man, this man of stature, he had a reputation to uphold, standards to uphold, and you can be sure, you can be sure that everyone in that village knew what kind of disrespect the younger son had given him. And if anyone had seen the son before the father did, they would have assumed the son would have a high price to pay. But the father didn't care what anybody else thought. He didn't care about protecting his pride or his position. He only cared about one thing. One thing. Having his son back. And so he ran. He ran to welcome and embrace him and he ran to cover his half-starred, unwashed bum of a son with kisses because he loved him and nothing else mattered. The son who had been dead to him was alive again. The lost was found. To the Pharisees and teachers of the law who assumed that God only stays close to those who through their own efforts stay close to God. This picture of how God treats sinners was shocking. We sometimes forget how radical this parable is. Jesus was revealing something important about what God is like. Our God is a running God. God loves us with a recklessly extravagant love, a crazy love. There are no limits, and God will do whatever it takes to bring it to us. Because there's a third son in the story, the one telling it. Our God is a running God. He runs to welcome us home because there's nothing we can do to make ourselves worthy to be called his sons and daughters. Nothing. He ran to us, gave us faith, saved us, washed us clean, though we didn't deserve any of it. And the father doesn't stop running just to the prodigal son. He runs out at the end of, during the party and he runs to the older brother because he wants him to come in. Jesus is telling the Pharisees and the religious scholars that God does not just run to the sinners and the tax collectors. He's running after them too. It's radical. It's radical to know that God's love is not depending, dependent on us not dependent on anything we do. That's God's amazing grace. But once we feel that love, once we experience that love, we want to share it. But we, we hear what we want to hear sometimes, don't we? We, like those religious scholars of Jesus' day, often only want to deal with people who are like us. People who look like us, people who act like us, people in our same social economic level. But Christ calls us to be like God, to be like the Father in the parable, to run th towards those who are not clean and not perfect. That's the type of Father we want our God to be. Someone who doesn't care what anyone else thinks and will come running to welcome us home. There was a young man named Robert Robinson. And in the mid-1700s, he had been saved 
from a very sinful life through the ministry in England of George Whitfield. Soon afterward, he was this 23-year-old man wrote the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune, thy, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. But sadly, Robinson drifted away from those streams he'd written about, and like the prodigal son, journeyed to a time of decadence in his life. Then one day, he was riding in a stagecoach, sitting next to a young woman who was deeply engrossed in a book, and she ran across a poem that she thought was so beautiful, and she asked Robinson, sitting next to her, what he thought of it. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Bursting into tears, he said, Madam, I'm the poor, unhappy man that wrote that hymn. And I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had back then. And though greatly surprised, she reassured him and, that, and told him, You know, those streams of mercy still flow. He was so deeply touched. Turning his wandering heart back to God, he was restored to full fellowship with his God and with his friends. Our God is a running God. Our God is a God of crazy love. Our God runs to welcome us home with his amazing grace. Amen.